Lights. Camera. Watch. Anatomy of a fall. Watch. Watch. Definitely. So for our audience, this is a French movie yep. with very much a mm-hmm. lot of it in English, but very m- much in French as well, too. So French filmmaker from France. Um, this year's Palme d'Or winner at the Cannes Film Festival. Thank you, because I have no idea of any of that stuff. Okay. <laughs> you know what the Cannes Film Festival is, though, yeah? Yes. Okay, so, and then Palme d'Or is the top prize. Wow. So this was the winner of uh, Cannes, and the director, whose name I cannot pronounce for the life of me, for it is in French, mm-hmm. is one of three women ever to take this prize. Go. So it's a historic Let's win. Let's go. So I'm glad you like this. Look. I saw the trailer. Uh I did not... What I liked about trailers, and I always say it, I want it to be mysterious. Don't give me away the plot. Give me some ideas about it. It gave me some ideas what the movie is going to be about. But I did not know what I was walking into, Uh what to expect. And very much, this movie was kind of a little bit of everything. Yeah. I definitely... Like, I knew it was going to be, like, a courtroom drama, but Mm. this is, like, the least courtroom drama courtroom drama, even though I find the scenes that happen in the courtroom probably the most compelling. Yeah, I agree. And I I wanted to talk about a lot of the scenes and stuff like that. So, if we want to dig into the the, the drama of this, um, this... One of my favorite scenes is the trial. You know what I mean? And there's multiple scenes of the trial. But we also have to remember is this is a trial in France and the way they do the courts is... Chaos! Yes. I don't know if that's like legit or I I know that there is another French film that came out. Um, I'm not sure if it was this year or last year, but I didn't get a chance to watch it. I know called Saint Omer. No idea. Okay. I know that that is like a French film that also takes place mostly in a courtroom. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to watch it just to see if like the France courtroom situation is the same because Mm. that is chaos. Yeah, so our audience, when you have an opportunity to watch the movies, it's like it's an organic trial where the defendants, like lawyers and the the, the defendant and the prosecution is both being able to free ball communicate. Yeah, and they can talk to whoever they want. They can like interrupt each other. Yeah, It's, it's it's pretty intense and it's foreigners watching a foreign movie it's like wow is this Where's real this structure like where, where is, and you know what the thing too is the uh, there is it seems like no structure but there seems like there is a giant structure that it's just oh, well yeah. matter it's it just seems like everybody has an opportunity to like throw the other person off guard you know what i mean if they make their uh, accusation to someone the, the the defendant side could come in and just uh, rip it apart and be like yo this is a bunch of garbage i i really what i think what separated this was the moment that really stuck out to me is when they played the USB. Yeah. And we went from a trial to an engagement and communication between the husband and wife. So to me, that's the most gripping part of the movie. So we're just going to jump right in. Okay. Because so uh, a little bit of context with it. uh, Her husband is either killed or falls out of the top story of their home. Yes. As it goes on, the first like hour and a half of this movie is like investigating, talking to detectives, mm-hmm. living in their world, mm-hmm. and then like the second hour and a half is like fully in the courtroom. Yep. Um, first of all, I think the room that the courtroom is in, like the actual courtroom itself, was very very cool. Yep. Um, but as the trial proceeds, like more and more information comes out, and it mm-hmm. like throws you back and forth of like. Do you think she did it? Do you think she not did it? Because the film is very unclear about... Constantly. It, it, it never gives you a straight answer. Mm-hmm. So that piece of information, I think, is the biggest piece of information that puts the prosecution like against her. Mm-hmm. So it, her husband records their... Private conversations. Private conversations and doesn't tell her that it's happening. Mm-hmm. And records like a big argument that happened the day before. Mm-hmm. And everything else we hear about the husband, like we never get his perspective, of course, because you don't get the perspective of a dead man. Mm -hmm. So you're only seeing it from her perspective, her eyes. And this is the one time that it switches to instead of like talking about a flashback or being a flashback, it is then played out in real time as this. But like the film, we're seeing them interact. But the courtroom, it's just being played and transcribed. Yeah, which is really cool. I like there's moments that they transcribe it. Um, What's it about that whole portion? 
in the States, it's illegal to record someone without their consent. Mm. And it can't be used against you. I didn't know that. Yeah, because every time, like, you know, there's shows like The Wire and stuff like that, yeah. like, they kind of have to go to some judge and be like, look, well, there's an opportunity to incriminate someone and correct me, lawyers, if I'm wrong or scrutinize me later, that they need to get permission to wiretap someone. Mm. Whereas in this guy kind of just had recordings of their conversations and by chance it was but it wasn't like i'm trying to suspect anyone like he was trying to do it for his own creative project absolutely and the conversation turns out to be um he's blaming his wife yeah for not having enough time to do abc and it seems like every time that he brings up an excuse his wife rationally through the majority of the conversation is like well you didn't want to live in london we came to France. Mm-hmm. We from France. We came to your hometown. Um, I don't know the language. I'm learning French. You know, um, like the, <laughs> you're you, upset. We speak English, yes. but he, I speak German. You speak French, so we speak English. Yes. So it's like a middle ground. It's like it seems that every moment in their conversation, it's like she has a rebuttal to him, and sort of like I feel in many ways that she is the more dominant character. Oh yeah. And, and for him, he's like. The, the starving artist, like the fragile artist that's like, oh, if only I had more time, I can be so creative, so capable of stuff like that, where you really hear the wife saying like, look, you've done work. I think it's great, but it's like, you're not putting in effort. Like, it's like you give up. It's like, you have to focus and carve out time. It's mm-hmm. like, how is she able to do it? And he's not able to do it. And you he, know? he blames it as like, well, I'm the one taking care of the kid full time. And yeah. she's like, well, you wanted to homeschool him. You didn't have yeah. to. And it, she really turns everything back on him because she's like, it was like, I just want time to write. And she's like, I can write in any situation is something that she says like multiple times, especially mm-hmm. in the beginning when she's like pleading her case. Like, it doesn't matter the conditions. I can be tired. It can be loud. Like, mm-hmm. I can write in any occasion. Well, he just makes excuses not to write. But that's his yeah. biggest issue with her for some reason is mm-hmm. like, you don't give me the time to pursue my creativity. Yeah. And then it really becomes like a blame game of like the result of their child's accident becoming partially or somewhat blind. And it's like, it's your fault. It, he ha- This happened, you mm-hmm. know? And from that moment, like that tragedy had impacted their marriage, their love, their passion to the point that she cheated on him with not another man, but actually with women. Yeah. And I think for him, that is also a giant blow to his ego because it's kind of like, a masculine thing mm. you know what i mean it's like yeah i'm hooking up with girls i go out i do the job i still come and take care of the family and you're over here like and i'm cook- a best-selling author <laughs> yeah and i'm a best-selling author and people want to interview me and all these expenses are your fault and it's like you cook you clean you take care of the house you want to do all these things but you have options to do like not homeschool your kid yeah. you know we, they could have stayed in London where she wanted to stay in London and she was happy over there too. But for some reason, it's like everything is her fault and she refuses to play the victim or accept blame even when there's points and she's all like, I don't see my child's handicap. I don't see it like as a handicap, you yeah. know? And I think in many ways, well, it's I respect that too, for her. Because like the accident happens when the father is supposed to be caring for him but he Mm -hmm. couldn't so he called a babysitter Mm -hmm. so neither of them were when the accident happened so Mm. truthfully it's neither of them's fault yeah it's nobody's fault accidents happen the tragedies happen all the time yeah she blames him because he was supposed to be in his care Mm -hmm. but like you weren't in his care either neither of you were it was a third party and no one can stop that it probably would have happened either way yeah, it, when we like just dig in and like we go into that conversation, it just blows my mind because for every complaint or concern he has, she has an answer. Yeah. And there's no way I don't agree with the woman. Like I really agree with the wife and I'm like, look, like she's not being unreasonable. It just kind of seems like you want to win these small battles when you won all the wars, you know? And then the second half of that conversation is very interesting because mm-hmm. it is kind of how everything else in this film is where the evidence can be like really interpreted in any way absolutely because the end of that conversation that's recorded becomes very violent oh and you hear hitting and you hear attacking and you hear like struggle and you don't they don't show us that and they don't show you it at all so you don't really know what's happening but for the court she says like 
Um, he grabbed me, then he started hitting himself in the head, mm -hmm. then he was screaming, then he punched the wall. Yeah, and you have evidence of that. You have yeah. evidence of the walls being punched. Mm -hmm. And take it that there's no bruises or like possible, like there's like there's moments that like he's punched his hand and there's x-rays of him getting his fingers br broken because of the, he did not hit his wife. Obviously he punched the wall, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's like there's parts where it's like, you know, maybe this woman is right, you know, and uh, the court is trying to make us really believe that she was possible of committing this crime. Mm -hmm. And it, it which is very interesting yeah, because the man is dead uh -huh. and the prosecutor is like so aggressive to be yes, like, you very. are the murderer. Yes. Like you, we have stone cold proof that this was a murder mm -hmm. when like in reality, the whole point of this film is that there's a lot of information missing here mm -hmm. and you don't know. And the fact that like he doesn't have like he's just like what the court appointed whoever mm -hmm. there to like stand on the opposite side. And he's like pushing so freaking hard yeah. that she did it is insane. Yeah, it's, it's sort of like they want her to be the bad guy. Oh, 100%. And, and very much I don't want to bring up historical references because he's a French dude and she's German. And like, fr you know, Germany is invaded france several times you mm. know throughout history and it's like yo you guys are the bad guys you know what i mean well they, they say it on the news at one point because like she's a best-selling author so yeah. the story is like being like her court is being broadcast or whatever and it mm. says well the author the bisexual author like killing her husband is the much more interesting story than the sad man killing himself yeah it's it just it makes it's like all bad news is good news as they say yeah um but i find it very interesting that every time there's a point that's brought up it, they present the argument of the interpretation. So, for example, when the therapist comes on uh -huh. and she's like, oh, he's just been like feeling this uh, unhappy, you know, he's been off his meds, he's doing all these things. He's just constantly trying to say, like, you're the fault mm -hmm. as the wife, you know? But the wife very much says that, you know, like sometimes we have to take responsibility for our situations. And it's always like, this is your interpretation of what is going on. Like, you only see my husband or saw my husband for like one hour or once a week. Whereas in, I lived with them for hours, yeah. you know? It's like, how much can you really know of someone when you go in there and just vent to someone for one hour? As opposed to living with them for days, years. And again, like each piece of information that comes out, like it goes back and forth again. Because I feel like his testimony, like his... Um psychiatrist I yeah don't know. therapist therapist's testimony is so first of all can a therapist testify against you in court isn't it like a i don't know what, maybe how for it murder works. or it's french i don't know I, I guess it's the what the court system works like you know like him being like oh like he's been taking this medication for a long time he slowly wanted to wean off mm -hmm. he does it because of you that was like really really against her on the side of like oh like she's causing these these issues and the stuff but then she made up the point that like why would you why would he ask to be like weaned off the medication and then stop taking it entirely mm -hmm. and like you're the bad guy in this and stuff but like you still really don't know because i feel like after he testified mm -hmm. it was like oh she's screwed yeah and then the video came after that and it's mm -hmm. like oh, okay well maybe she really did do it mm -hmm. but then like she had such a strong point for every counter but I did, they just kept having stuff that they could like throw against her. Yeah, it's like you think the court case is done. Mm -hmm. And then you bring in this lady that shows that, you know, they, they show the blood splatter of like how possibly it was able that this woman like could have killed this man. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, but they sh she explains like, you know how big this guy is? How much I weigh? Do you know how the railing is this this high? It's like, how could I do this and physically hit him with an object and then push him back? Yeah. And then they go to explain, like, look, if he fell and there was blood on that shack connected to their house, given that X amount of time would pass by, mm -hmm. that blood on top of that snow would melt and that would drip down onto the shed, which would create the blood, blood splatter. splatter. And I thought that was amazing. I did not even think of that. Every time they do something i was like oh well they point out a different perspective whereas it could have not happened to them yeah it, it, it's just fantastic they keep going and it's like i think this movie is it's a lot about what's missing than what's there yeah because like you can ask the question of like her and her lawyer mm -hmm. are they ex-lovers i think so 
they, they could have been they've never uh, said it they just yeah. have like an energy and at the beginning when they first meet she was like he you know he says like it's weird seeing you again yes or, I, I don't know I, yeah nobody knows and he's a good-looking guy and you know like it just seems like she's a girl that's like ha- likes sex and you can't hate on her yeah but i i like to point out one more point um from the prosecution side is when the guy that brings up the data from the usb the it guy uh-huh. he already says like well when we play this it's already assuming like she's the bad guy yeah. you know what i mean it's like but that's your interpretation like everything is kind of like on an individual's ter- interpretation that's what really is fascinating to me about this entire case and also with the recording is they say like oh usually um he tells me when he's recording our conversations mm-hmm. but this one he didn't mm-hmm. and he comes pretty aggressive at the start of the conversation yeah. and they say something along the lines of like do you think he like he could have been doing that to get a reaction out of me yeah because like it's it everything is so unsaid that it just leaves such mystery and intrigue because you really don't know yes very much so it, it, and I, it could have been like he was doing this stuff to blame the fall on her in the end. You know, yeah. just leaving all these breadcrumbs. I mean, we can't like, and then the the, the whole like uh, piece of information where they're trying to prevent the son to be in the courtroom because they discovered that the husband potentially might have committed suicide uh-huh. or overdosed on Tylenol or something like that. And that's just like, imagine like how that courtroom is like the judge was like, I don't want you to be in the courtroom tomorrow because they know what they're possibly going to talk about. Yeah. They said like, you shouldn't be there. And he says like, hit this scene is like very, very devastating. Something along the lines of like, we can't um, keep your feelings from like exposing who's correct or whatever. And he says something along the lines of like, I'll be obsessed of it. Yeah. Like I'll just like, I wouldn't be able to get over it. It's better for me to be in the room. And she's like, oh, but like, we don't want to risk the information hurting you. And he says, like, I've already been hurt. And it's like, well, damn. And also, like, multiple times while they're in the courtroom, Mm -hmm. they cut to, like, the camera, like, from his cheek. I don't Mm -hmm. know if you noticed that. So it's, like, pretty much his perspective. Mm -hmm. And also, like, I just, like, the the fact that he can't see everything is kind of like the whole thing of the movie. It's like, you can't really see everything that's happening. Wow, I didn't take that. It's like, you're... Because so much is happening from, like, weirdly his perspective. Yes, and you've only hear things. That's the only... That's that's such a great perspective. I didn't even think of that. Like, he is, in many ways, us, as the viewer of the situation. It's like, even from the beginning of the movie, where he discovers the body, like, he doesn't see how it happens. That's also interesting, because, like... In that moment, mm-hmm. we don't know he's like blind mm-hmm. or partially blind or however. I, I, I got the sense of it just because I saw the red rope and stuff like that. Yeah. Where he's at that. But like, think about like what you're walking into, you know, like you, and you're like shaking your dad. It kind of like the the Lion King moment of like when Simba's Very- like, hey, <laughs> hey, get up, get up. And it's like you still hear the music being blasted. And then the mom just like rushing down, calling. And they live in like this mountainous area. Yeah. And it's going to take a minute for anybody to show up but when you bring up the dog it's interesting to see that when the son hears about the dad committing suicide Mm -hmm. and he replays a situation where his dog got sick and he just remembers because he ate something from the floor that his dad threw up on Mm -hmm. so he knows now that that was Tylenol so he he does this weird thing, which as us the audience gets weird. I was out. so stressed for this dog. So. Yeah. Oh, I I, <laughs> I want to backtrack for a second. The kid says, "I don't want you to come home, mom." Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, and, and it, is that the moment? Because like at that moment we're like, "Oh my god, this kid really thinks his mom did it." Well, yeah, because there's. Like, so he's not, to backtrack even more, he's not allowed in the courtroom that day. He says, you should let me in the courtroom that day. And that's the day where the suicide attempt comes out. Mm -hmm. That's the day where the cheating comes out. Mm -hmm. Because none of that happened before. It was just like, this is the evidence we have against like, how it could be a murder versus like, how it could be a fall versus how it could be, they don't mention the suicide yet. It's just the fall. And so that day it's, it's, it's the cheating. It's the marriage. All the bad stuff. All the bad stuff. And... The kid, first of all, he's awesome in this movie. I know. He's a great actor. He's like Fantastic. very, very good in this movie. Yes. Um, he, I've lost my train of thought, but the the dog 
in the his last testimony the fact that you yeah. like he doesn't want his mom to come home yes and he the shower scene where he's just like taking a long shower yes he's contemplating that anything like this could have happened this could be real you don't know when he says like because they have the moment where he goes to the judge and they like the judge is pulled out of the room he says he's it's urgent and you don't know what's happening and then he comes back into the room so it's clear that he spoke to the judge you don't know if it's like good for the mom or bad for the mom because mm. right before that the mom was asked not to return to the house mm -hmm. and his final testimony is i think i think if he didn't do the final testimony at the end like she would have been locked up this is the interesting part for me is he was playing detective and he had to try this theory and try to figure out whether his mom could have done this and whether his dad actually nearly committed suicide yeah so he had to poison his dog and he freaked out and then like if that lady marge was not there to help and uh, thanks sorry whatever app it is that he has to drink <laughs> it's like and the dog started throwing up by the way the, audi the, audi the audience does not care about humans but god forbid one animal dies the entire body but the cinema's reaction of a sick animal is the it's, worst it's like not a dog you expect people to die in a movie but yeah. when an animal dies in the movie it's, it's like, like you've oh, made that choice yes so it's like why you gotta do that and the dog survives so yeah. he thinks give like, him an oscar though what a dog yeah, i know what i don't know sick. if it was like a stuffed animal that they did to that i don't, or I don't, I I don't, no idea. I, I don't know how but bless the guy can barely get my dog to sit but um <laughs> this when he found that out i think that kind of changed the game for him now what we will never really understand or know is when he goes to testify he tells the story about his dad and him driving and taking their dog to the vet i believe yep and the dad kept trying to hint us like you know he's not getting any younger you know he's again there's a day you're gonna have to say goodbye and you will never know why and whatever it is and it's gonna be difficult it's as if he's preparing him for a tragedy to occur yeah now with all of that being said we as the audience will always play those advocate did that guy just did the kid make up that story mm -hmm. or did it really happen because spoiler alert when he says that story we discover that she is found innocent yeah and that's the crazy part is if he didn't share that story and if he's so aware of what's going on and maybe thought to himself like my like i don't want to be abandoned you know because he could be in like at least my mom loves me yeah. you know and doesn't see me as a weakling or anything like that and he says the very affecting line of like when i think about my mom doing it it doesn't make sense to me but when i think about my dad doing it it does yeah and also it's very interesting because again the prosecutor when he does the dog experiment says like well the dog experiment proved absolutely nothing mm. and that's just invalid information but like this story about him taking his dad is like pretty much the final concluding piece of evidence like is interesting that that matters but like the concrete evidence doesn't which is also yeah. just kind of thematically throughout the movie <laughs> yeah it seems that all the concrete evidence there's just a counterpoint like, yeah it's so always like a ma magician's trick like oh did you it's like oh nope this is how you actually really do it i kind of felt like that in every way especially with the conversations the arguments that the two lawyers would have mm -hmm. especially the moments that like oh you, the 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 prosecution's like you stole your husband's idea she's like i took an idea and i made it 300 freaking pages so how are you telling me that someone said like oh it's like you know someone seeing a basketball game and writing an entire a story about like this struggling basketball player and coming up from the ashes like how and he's also like audacity saying so much of this like isn't valid and then just reads from her fictional story yeah but the movie does open with the interview and saying so much of her work is like intertwined with her real life and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff but again it's a fictional story she wrote years and years and years before you know what my favorite part of this movie was one of the actually one of the greatest lines hit me is when the, the 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 defendant's lawyer was all like, so by your analogy, then Stephen King is a serial killer. Yeah, you know what I mean. Uh huh. Because he like that's there's been, he's so right. Because there has been actual court cases where people have gone and started researching how to murder someone or kidnap someone, but all they're doing is doing research for a book. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to go in 
as someone that let's say hypothetically loved all these like murder mysteries or these criminal stories on the podcast and you start glue glue and then someone's gonna be like whoa look at their search history yeah you know homeland security is gonna be like yo something's up over here in middle america <laughs> <laughs> um I went to see a movie that came out earlier this year called How to Blow Up a Pipeline. Oh, wow. And I was looking at showtimes at work, and I googled how to blow up a pipeline, and someone came into work the next day and was like, who was on this computer? Um, but for me, I, I, I'll save that comment. I'll, I have a comment later that we'll, I'll talk about in our next podcast. But it was, I, sometimes I am more and more impressed by the growth of cinema globally because we always think like our product is the best product yeah and i'm not gonna lie pro rata share whatever you want to say is like we usually have the best product Mm -hmm. but like when a movie like this comes along and i'm all like because like there's three movies i watched this year that are somewhat international in my opinion americazzi past lives and this one oh and passages too yeah They've all been fantastic. Past Lives is pretty American, though, even though it's I, not, I, yeah. I, I, you know what I mean. There's like, a, there's a flavor of, you know, uh, ethnicity in it, you know? Even though it's just an American movie and stuff yeah. like that. An immigrant story. Yeah, an immigrant story. But I'm like, wow, these are really good. And I'm like, so many of these movies are just kind of flying under the radar. Where, like, Oppenheimer and Barbie, to their respects, deserves all the attention. But I'm like, this deserves way more publicity than fast x or oh yeah you know what i mean or any other movie that like or the transformers movie i'm like more audiences need to watch these movies because there are a lot of crappy movies but i'm all like i don't think there was anybody that walked into this movie that was like wow they didn't walk out like damn well what i'm interested about is that this wasn't even picked for the french submission for um the oscars this year for the international category um let me check the name of the movie i know it's like a they, food they, movie my friends in uh, perry you have made a giant mistake because this movie was sensational and you know what i loved about the movie in the beginning where it's just like all of this french like written stuff i don't know if it was like the intro to the movie or the title and it, we didn't read it but it was just interesting to see it i mean the movie starts off fantastically with just like an interview and then out of nowhere ironically you hear 50 cents p-i-m-p so that that is a very crucial piece to this movie because i want to i want to save that well i think we're nearing the end we're nearing the end but first of all the the french film that was chosen is called the taste of things okay it is a period piece set in the 1800s about a personal chef oh wow so i'm sure we'll check that one out as well cool but um First of all, I did read that the original song choice was going to be Jolene. Oh, really? Which is two on the nose. I think it's oh. very smart that they chose it to the 50 Cent song. I think it's hilarious. And I think it's even better that it's like a steel drum instrumental. Yes. That's hysterical. Exactly. That is like, hysterical. Yes, that's the best part. The Well, the biggest piece of information, which is going to lead me to asking you the question, is like the, the song is blaring. They're having the interview. They can't even speak over at each other. She goes to the floor below where it's happening and takes a nap, but can still hear her son call for her. Like... I don't know. Like, really, sometimes... You know, I've been in areas where things are loud and then you hear something. It just, your ear picks it up because, you know, after a certain moment, that... Because it's been on repeat so much... Yeah. That, like, maybe you're ear just like gets used to it gets used to it because you've been in places where like it's a loud noise and get used to it and you come out and like your ears kind of buzzing that's not to say but maybe she knew he killed himself and just let him die do you think she did it me no okay i don't think in my opinion i think he wanted to die he was tired and he just like in many ways felt like I think some people are looking for someone to blame. Yeah. And um, he has the, I guess, opportunity in many ways that his son won't see the death. Mm -hmm. But he gets something even worse because he's he's consumed by his murder or death or loss. Yeah, because like even the trial happens one year later. Yeah. 
um she says like a like i just can't imagine him doing it because with him so nearby because like clearly like obviously he's gonna find out and stuff and he is partially blind so like not not necessarily gonna see it in its like totality even though it does happen but at the beginning of this movie there's a black screen with white writing over it that says did she do it.com is it you you were on your phone <laughs> um so after the movie i went home and i went on did she do it.com and it's a poll yes or no huh? and so after watching this movie after whatever i pressed no okay uh-huh. i was like i genuinely think this man killed himself so it was 85 percent yes wow. i felt like an idiot <laughs> why i was like am i like dumb <laughs> like, no i don't but th- i understand that like the premise of like hey, you have to go to a murder trial. You say you didn't push him under, but there is a blood splatter that can assume that he's been hit and thrown off the balcony. You guys were fighting the day before. It is blaring 50 cent. You were in the closest place to him and you're napping. Like, that's your alibi. I. It makes sense that she totally could have done it, I but do. I genuinely believe he killed himself. I believe he killed himself. The wife knew he killed her and just didn't care. He was in so, in so many ways... I think she was per- like, like in. It- no, she would have tried to cover it up before the son came home. How? Good point. She would have been tried How? for murder. Like the thing too is, if she she's smart. She also says something when the video comes out, like, "Oh, I didn't want to tell you guys we were fighting because I didn't want to look guilty." It's like, why are you guilty? Because she's not stupid. Mm-hmm. She writes these books. She knows what people are gonna assume. And I think in society, there's been so many times where men have totally... And to this day, there are men constantly killing women all over the planet. Yep. But, like, you don't really see, like, women killing men. But at the same time, it just... People just want to say, like... I don't want to say, like, they... Oh, it's like, just blame the woman. You know what I mean? It's her fault, you know? She couldn't... She drove him crazy. Yeah. It's like, how about if this person was just, like, a weak individual and couldn't handle somebody else's success and all your failures you know what i mean yeah and sometimes i always think to myself like i want to be a trophy husband i generally have no problem being a trophy husband working out having a six-pack cooking cleaning the house if my wife is making seven six figures i'm all like great yeah you know how much fun i would have i would have so much fun <laughs> you are not the fair play man <laughs> i would definitely be the fair. i would you have no idea I would be like, honey, you make that money. I'm working at Trader Joe's. <laughs> I, I've always joked to people. I'm like, I want a job at Trader Joe's. Those people seem too fucking happy stacking those cans. I say, I feel like their existence is like, God, they have like, they just stack cans. Everyone seems in a per- cheery mood. You're physically like engaging with people. People love to be in Trader Joe's. They just hate the parking lot. Yeah. Um, why are they so small? They will never figure it out. It's just, it's just the... It's just the devil's cruel joke. <laughs> I, I don't know. But I really, if you want to watch a good movie, watch Anatomy of I want to put one Please. one negative on this movie. I want to okay. say I thoroughly enjoyed this movie. I okay. was very much anticipating this movie coming out. I heard great things about it. It has a pacing problem. I didn't see it. I didn't feel it. I felt it like mm-hmm. a decent amount. It is two and a half hours. There is a lot of space in it and i don't think that it's bad i think it has the complete opposite like not opposite but like issue of like the next movie we're going to talk about which is killers of the flower moon Mm -hmm. where like killers of the flower moon i don't know what you would cut to make that shorter Mm -hmm. and this it's like okay i don't have a problem with long movies but i have a problem with long movies that are too long just to be long and not saying that everything in this movie isn't great because i really really did enjoy this movie it's just there are some things where i'm like damn we are very much lingering yeah. i want to i remember something this is that a I quiet wanna... story i did think it was very compelling all the way through yeah i, I there is a part part of the story that really just uh, kicked me in my mind is remember the scene where the woman and her lawyer are there and he just grabs his face and just holds yeah, it. Yeah, I'm telling you, they're lovers and they don't tell you because the whole thing is they don't tell you everything. Yes, I, I, I kind of felt like they wanted to bang like right there. Yeah. You know what I mean? But there is also that other moment where she is there in that Chinese restaurant and she can't use her chopsticks for the love of her to like, she's just like having like a crippling moment, you know? Mm-hmm. She, she thinks that like, oh my God, like, 
the like the, she comes back he comes back with the shots and she's like ready to like fall apart yeah where it's like god did i just survive that or is it like is this like finally i get to breathe you know because sometimes people when they're under such stress mm mm-hmm. They're used to stress, but when the moment the stress leaves, they like have an anxiety attack because that vacuum of like is 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 there. You know, it's this giant vacuum of life. Jeez, man, they did very well. very good one. It's a very good film. I gotta figure out how to end these podcasts. I know, right? <laughs> good night, everybody.